Today's topic is in the meantime. This month we've talked about our natural and inherent innocence, that everyone is born innocent, no one's born a murderer or a criminal. We are not born guilty, we are not born sinners, we are born innocent, pure, beautiful beings of light and love. And then these layers get added the moment we're birthed into form. And we can forget our natural inherent innocence. So our journey is about remembering to remember our always already innocence, our always already purity of heart, our always already enlightened state of awakening, of our unification always with the divine presence. And then last week we were talking about persevering in knowing our innocence and really claiming and choosing what our path is. What are our spiritual practices that we do every day to remember that innocence, to call it forth? What are those, who are those teachers in our life and do we claim them? Are we waiting for the path to call us or the teacher to claim us or do we demand and choose who our, path, who our teachers are and what our path is? And then persevere, not let go, not being willing to stop and persevering our journey to greater and greater innocence or enlightenment, one and the same. So today is in the meantime. One of the things we notice is that a lot of our life is in the meantime. We're waiting around. So we're doing our spiritual practices, but when I don't know how many of you feel. I don't feel yet I'm at the level of pure enlightenment. Got a long way to go, actually. So what do we do in the meantime? We're doing our daily spiritual practices. We have in the meantime when you're stand, sitting at a red light. We are in the meantime, meantime when we're standing in a line. Anytime we're sort of in between something, you're on a project, and I don't know, I'm, I heard this often growing up. Uh, when this project's over, I'll have time to do, spend time, because I had, so you're sort of in the meantime waiting for that project to end, or you're waiting for... Uh, vacation to happen, or you're waiting for a new job to show up, or you're wait- or finding a new job, or a new relationship. We're waiting. We've left one thing, and we're moving into something else. How do we live in the meantime? I think that becomes almost an art of itself, and we can look at the biggest picture, which is life itself is in the meantime, that all this journey is temporary, nothing lasts, so this whole journey is in the meantime. You know, on, on the tombstones, they have the birth date and the death date and that dash is the in the meantime from ignorance to enlightenment in the meantime from being in prison to being free in prison to anything to being free in the meantime so we're living a life of in the meantime so really it becomes how do we live artistically spiritually with as greatest possibility in the meantime while we're waiting because so much of our life is about waiting it seems. There are three things that I've come up with that are the most important, at least that I could see, uh, or at least feel today, of how to live this life in the meantime. It's connection, it's participation, and it's forgiveness. It's very hard to live a full life if we're not connected, participating, and forgiving. Before we talk about connection, I want to talk about what it looks like not to be connected. This past week, Jack and I saw the film uh, Rocket Man. How many of you have seen Rocket Man? A few of you. Some of you have, yeah. And that's with the story about Elton John. I found it so moving. And one of the things that I found so moving was the pain in the midst of it. It was, so, it was depicted brilliantly. So here is a man who, by age 25, was a multimillionaire. Incredible talent, musical gifts, music, singing, playing the piano, performing. He just had it all. So he's multimillionaire by age 25, becomes a drug addict, addicted to alcohol, addicted to sex, shopping. He has everything. He has the total freedom that Ray Hinton does not have. Aunt Ray Hinton, for those of you who don't know, was on, it was innocent and yet put on death row and lived on, he was incarcerated for 30 years, 28 of those years, was living in a five by seven cell by himself for 28 of those years. Totally opposite of Elton John. But Elton John was as big a prison as Ray, in, in, in another way. He had everything he could possibly want, unlimited, and because he had so much money, he could just have more and more. 
and watch for me watching that film and I think that was the intent maybe one of the intents of the film was just seeing the the total emptiness at the core of all of it he was never happy none of it ever filled him he could have more and more and more as much freedom as he wanted and there was that total emptiness hollowness at the center of his being what he lacked was connection That if we're fully going to be alive in the meantime, it's about being connected. Without that connection, we can have everything, but there's still an emptiness. There's still a longing, a hungering, a starvation. So what happens with Ray, the, the part that Cher read so beautifully this morning, is that shift that Ray makes. He had stopped praying for those three years. He lived in anger and rage. He was living in the past. He was going through every minutiae detail of the trial. He was planning what he would do if he ever got out or how to get out. He was never fully present where he was in death row. And he wasn't, so he wasn't connected with himself. He wasn't connected with God. And he wasn't connected with anything happening around him. The moment he let that man's sobs enter him, connection started to happen. He started to feel connected with himself, who he was, who he really was. And that shifted everything. That opened him up to his connection with God. It opened him up to his connection with those people who are around him, including the guards, even those people that seemed to be his prisoner, who were imprisoning him, who were holding him. He, he started developing a relationship with them. He became connected He chose to be connected. It didn't just happen. He made the decision. He made the decision to be himself no matter what, to still laugh, to still cry, to still give of himself wherever he could. He connected with his part of him that always loved to be of service, to be, make other people feel good, to love. He had been deeply loved his whole life. He was very blessed. For those of you who don't know the story, not only did he have a mother that came to visit him, on de- regularly, she had health problems as, as much as she could. He had a best friend who came for 30 years, did not miss a week, to visit him. I mean, that's a love and a friendship. And he said he realized most people had no idea what it was like to be loved that deeply and profoundly. So he was so loved himself. And from that, he was able to give love so freely to other people. One of the things he did to create connection is I, I mentioned last week that they weren't allowed to have any books in their cells other than the Bible, which would get boring. So he worked with the warden and finally agreed to allow them to have other books in their cells, and they would get the same book. Only few books were allowed in, and they would pass them around so they'd all be reading the same books. And he was allowed to start a book group. Only five or six people were allowed in the book group. I think it was six other people plus him, so it was a total of seven, because these are prisoners on death row, and they don't want them all in the same room. So they had them in a room, but they all had to sit at separate tables, so they, couldn't <laughs> so they sort of had to talk loudly to each other. What ha- you could just see the shift on death row. It was, he, as he, the, what, what made it convincing to the warden to do this is that it created greater peace, to have people start communicating. One of the relationships he develops, now they're yelling through these, they have just a little opening, and so that's how they're getting to know each other. They can't see each other. So they're yelling and getting to know each other, hearing each other's stories, talking about their cases, and one of the people he's connecting with is Henry, and he tells a few stories about Henry. And so then he gets this book group, and they go into a room, and he learns that Henry is white, and Henry's there for lynching a young black boy the last official lynching in Alabama. The healing that happens. The books they're reading, Go Tell It on the Mountain by James Baldwin, To Kill a Mockingbird, are all stories about race. And Henry, the white man, said, you know, I was was taught to hate since I was a kid. My dad was a hateful man, and, and he said, I now know everything he taught me was wrong. I've learned and experienced more love from you, Ray, than I ever experienced from my dad. I know what love is now. Healing happening on death row. Amazing thing happens as people read books and learn ideas. They're discussing what's happening in the book and how they feel, how they relate to their own life. There's a deep connection that's happening with each... We have our own book group here, by the way, Monday nights. 
through listening and hearing one in each other's stories, they're moving the compassion that starts radiating from Ray and saying, you know, I, I don't live in the illusion that everyone on death row is here innocently, like I am. Some people have done horrific things, but they were children once, and you hear their stories of how they were treated, how cruel their life was. They've never even had a taste of what love is. And he was very clear, I'm not justifying what they did as a result, but everyone deserves that love. And so they're getting these moments of being able to connect with each other and find the innocence within each other and give that love that so many of them had never experienced in their life. Every moment we are in a choice, do we love? Do we connect with the innocence, with ourselves, with God, and with each other? Even in the meantime, even when we're not perfect, even before we're enlightened, even before we get that new job, if we're trapped in a job that we don't like, if we are trapped in a relationship that we don't like, if we are trapped with a physical condition that we don't like, a diagnosis that we don't like, if we are stuck in a habit pattern that we don't like, and no matter what we do, we keep trying to get out and we're stuck and we feel imprisoned to whatever this condition or circumstances, even there in the midst of that is the divine love that knows no limits and no conditions. And we have an option. We have that choice choice to see that. That's why that reading is so powerful this morning. At every moment, we have a choice, even in that condition that we cannot change, we can choose to love. We can choose to love the depth of who and what we are to acknowledge that nothing can take away our own individual connection with the divine, with ourself, and with each other. And we can operate from that place. We can be at a work, at a job that we don't like, and still see the divine in those people who we don't like. Those people who seem like they're, or projects or the actual work itself, or people, whatever it is that feels confining in that salary, whatever those things that feel like they're keeping us walled in, we can make a choice to see in the midst of that prison is the divine presence. And I have. And we have the freedom to choose to see that light in a relationship that we feel stuck in. In the midst of that relationship, that person who we feel, whether it's a work relationship, a friendship, a family member, a spouse, a child, a parent, whatever that is, the relationship to see the divine in them, that thing that feels confining, that we feel blocked in, there is the infinite divine. In the midst of this difficult situation, I have a choice. We have a choice to love beyond condition. Nothing can ever limit us, not even those deepest areas of hell. Why, to me, this book was so amazingly touching and moving is because he is in circumstances that I don't think most of us will know in our lifetime. Hopefully none of us will. Of just being in such a dark place where you can't even see the sun, where you can't even see other people. You hear their voices. What choice would you make? Hopelessness, despair, anger, rage, or freedom. I love in Shawshank Redemption, it, it's almost parallel, the same idea. Andy Dufresne, the character, decides to create a library and starts to create connection among the prisoners. He makes life better where they are. Wherever you are, do you make life better? And that's the participating. In the moment we connect, we start participating. Are you participating fully in your life wherever you are? As we heard in the reading today, wherever you are is your home. Ray actually starts to refer to death row as his home. This becomes the place where he knows people, where he knows the routine. He's, instead of, he's working on becoming free. He's, he never stops. He's always working on his trial cases, and it's exhausting. Even as you're reading the book, it's amazing these processes and the years that it takes, years upon years upon years. And he's always working on it with his lawyer, but this is home. He cannot deny that as much as he knows he belongs out there, he belongs beyond an imprisoning job. We all know that in our teaching. We don't deserve to be in jobs that don't work, health that doesn't work, relationships that don't work, habits that don't work. We know that we deserve total, nothing but brilliance in every area of our life, and yet sometimes we don't get it for whatever reasons. He doesn't know why he is, as an innocent man, have this, this death row sentence upon him. It makes no sense, but there he is. He can either spend his life fighting it and hating it or making a home within it. What a powerful choice. That doesn't mean he, didn't, he was still striving to be, break free. He still knew he deserved to be free. But at the same time, simultaneously, he's finding a home within it. And what a difference that makes. We have so many homes. We have our, our home that we grew up in. 
our home of origin. We have our homes now where we live. We have, I think our cars are our home. We spend so much time in our cars, right? Our workplace can be our home. Do we consider it home? Do we create that space as a home place? Are we there? Are we present? Or is I can't wait to get out of here to go to my real home. I can't wait to get out of this job until or this week so I can go home, have a weekend off and I can go to my real home or go on my vacation or someplace else. Are we always... For me, the key of this is being present where we are. Home is wherever we are. Are we fully present? When I was at Agape... So many people wanted to enter practitioner training, so they, what they did was start a process of interviewing people before they entered class to see if they were really engaged and ready to be, enter practitioner training. So I remember when I got interviewed, I was really ready and anchored in my spiritual consciousness. I don't remember a single question the practitioner asked me other than one because it really threw me, but I thought it was the most profound question ever. So I'm going to throw it out to you as well. Actually, it's to all of us. She asked me, she said, Harriet, I need to ask you something. When you go to the bathroom and you go into a stall and there's no more toilet paper, do you just go into another stall? Or do you come out and tell someone on the staff to, that there's no more toilet paper and expect them to change it? Or do you go out and find out where the toilet paper is and then you change the toilet paper yourself? I was so stuck by that question. <laughs> I knew the right answer. <laughs> and it hadn't come up yet, but boy, did it wake me up in that moment. How committed I am. Because what they were finding is that so many people, when we, and I'm speaking as someone who's been in spiritual community now for 30 years, so many of us, when we first come, we're coming to get fed. We take classes to be fed. We come to Sunday services to be fed. We join things to be fed. But we don't participate. We don't say, this is a place where I belong. And we, we there's a... Sometimes people ask me, I want to feel like I'm connected more, and we feel like other people are going to make us feel connected. But my, I remember my mother years ago telling me, if you want to feel like you belong, participate. So I was thinking about that with St. Bart's. Those aren't our bathrooms. Where you, where their, their bathrooms are there. If the, I was thinking, oh, if the toilet, if there's no more toilet paper, would I just leave it and go to the other one expecting St. Bart's to take care of it? Would I go tell somebody at St. Bart's there's no more toilet paper, you might want to fix that? Or would I find out where the toilet paper is and change it myself? When we have, come in here in the morning, do you look around and say, is there anything that needs to get done? Is there any way that I can help? Is there anything that I see that isn't happening that I think I can contribute? How much are we participating is how alive we feel, how connected we feel. Connection comes through the prayer, first and foremost, prayer with the divine presence within, through, and as us. We're connecting with the divine and ourselves all simultaneously. From that, we start connecting with each other. We go to our classes. We go to our book groups. We have a great workshop on prayer today, in fact. It's also amazing, synchronistic prayer. Pre uh, workshop on prayer in our book group tomorrow night. And these are wonderful ways to connect. But until we make that next step where we're participating, wherever we are, whether you're at work, are you participating at work or are you just coming in and doing your job and leaving? Because it's just an environment for you to get something done and to get a paycheck. Are you participating? You know, I go to Starbucks a lot in the morning. And it was, it was so much so that at one point, I saw them, uh, they had left a box that needed to, and I'm like, I think I need to help them put their stuff on the shelf, because I feel like I'm here all the time. I might as well help out a little bit. <laughs> Do I wipe the tables when you go eat? Wherever we are, we belong. The divine presence is everywhere. Our car is our home. Are you participating in the environment of your car? Place is important. I really felt that as he's on death row. Place, creating a sense of place. Wherever we are and participating in it, we feel a connection, we feel at homeness. Connection, connection with the divine, connection with ourselves, connection with other people, and participating takes it to another level. That sense of really belonging, this is my home. In your relationships, are you participating? Are you connecting and participating in the relationship? Helping out where they need help or your friend, or your family, or someone you don't even know very well. That's how we create connection, not just, well, not 
Listening isn't just. Listening is an important emotional connection, but then do we participate in somebody's life if they need help? Or if we need help, do we allow them to participate in our life? That's a big one for us often on our independence. It's a big one for me. I'm so used to being independent, allowing someone to help me participate in my life. That creates a deep bond of aliveness. All of this is about being fully alive. It's so interesting that Ray Hinton used a very similar word. I'm sure he saw Shawshank Redemption. Because <laughs> he uses so similar words. Because in Shawshank Redemption, Andy Dufresne's character comes to the same conclusion and said, I either get better get busy living or get better get busy dying. And, and that's what Ray Hinton was saying in that reading. It's time for me to live because I'm not ready to die. In the meantime, our life is about in the meantime. How alive are we? How are alive are we now? Are we just waiting for the next great thing to happen, the next great job, relationship, the healing, the physical healing, the emotional healing? Or even in the midst of whatever's happening, are we fully alive? Connection, participation, and the last one to me is absolutely essential to be fully alive, and that's forgiveness. I think... When we hold on to stuff, we can't be fully present here because we got all this baggage going on. There's this great exercise with little kids. I think we should all do it. They have, you have the little kids put on a backpack with nothing in it and ask them to walk around. And then you fill the backpack full of rocks and stones and you ask them to put the backpack on and walk around. They say that's all the stuff that if you haven't forgiven, that's all the unforgiven stuff. And look how heavy it is. Carrying all this energy around, it takes so much energy to move it around. We're not free if we're holding on to resentment. The thing that Ray learned on his journey was forgiveness. He was so enraged, and he realized that he was in prison. As we all know, when we hold on to anger towards anybody, no matter how righteous that anger is, we all know he had righteous anger, he was innocent, he didn't belong there, he could be angry, at, well, he was angry, at, he was angry at everybody. But that imprisoned him. He could not be fully alive in the meantime if he was hanging on to anger. So he lived, he said, I keep vigilance in my heart. Even as he got out of prison, anytime I start to feel anger towards anything that has happened in the past, I immediately start working on my forgiveness because I don't ever want to be in prison again. Inwardly, I don't ever want to be in prison again. Because that was the most destructive place that I lived, whether it was on death row or whether now that he's free. I do not want to imprison myself. And so it's a vigilance that we do every day. It's not something that we do only on the big things. And what I find is self-forgiveness every day is the most important because we blame ourselves for so much. We want to live the best life. We want to be fully alive and loving and caring and joyful and generous and abundant. We want to be, I think everyone here, we want to be the best we can be. And we fall short of that every day. I fall short at every hour. I'm, I'm pretty bad at living my best self. So it requires me to stay vigilant on forgiving myself. I know my intention. I know what I want to be, who I want to be, and I know I don't always show up that way. To just, because the moment I forgive, it's like, oh, now I can be present again in the moment. Until I forgive, I'm not present in the moment. I'm still back. I don't even, sometimes I'm not even aware of it. I'm not even aware that I'm judging myself, but I'm judging myself or judging somebody else, and it's just blocking me. It's just, do you ever feel that? Like you're just sort of irritated and it's going on in the back of your head? But the moment we forgive, it's like, oh, finally, okay, now I'm here again, I'm alive, I'm okay, I'm not, I'm not a bad person, I'm not holding on to guilt, I'm not holding on to shame, I'm not going on to, holding on to embarrassment or blame, I am free, there's no way we can be free without forgiveness, there is no way we can be free without forgiveness, there's no way we can be free right now in this moment, fully alive in the meantime, without forgiveness, connection, participation, and forgiveness 70,000 times 70,000. It's never ending. <laughs> in the meantime, right now we're in the meantime. Where are we? So I was thinking, because often I give invitations for this week. I do, sometimes when I see people during the week, I'll ask, but I don't often get to hear the follow-up. But there's always a sense of futurizing, and I was realizing that, so this week, let's do this, or this month, let's do this, but it's right now. 
in the meantime is right now, to be fully alive is right now. How connected do we feel right now? How connected do we feel to our own self right now? How connected do we feel with the divine right now? How connected do we feel with other people in this room? It's all a choice right now. How connected do we feel with what's happening in our planet right now? How much are we willing to participate in our connection, in our aliveness right now? Are we waiting for that perfect thing for Harriet to say or the perfect music or that perfect prayer or that perfect moment externally? Or am I willing to participate in my joy, in my freedom, in my love right now? Am I the creator of my aliveness right now? And is there any place right now that I'm holding on to a judgment about myself or about somebody else? A little one or a big one, some blame, some shame that we might feel, some anger, some frustration, some resistance. Is there something for me to forgive right now? Not tomorrow, not when we leave. Right now, is there something, a place for me to forgive? And the more we connect with those three things throughout our day, As it's happening in the moment, we're going to experience true aliveness and true vitality. What's interesting about Ray's life on death row is that it did shift. As he was shifting, the guards felt differently about him. They were rooting for him. They were rooting. They were hoping they would get, make sure he would get his calls to his lawyers. They had special little ways to get him because they wanted him to succeed. They started to ask him for advice on things. Then they would take him out of his cell to their kitchen because it turns out he's a good cook, so he would have them cook the meals. And then he'd sit and talk with them, and he'd say, I give them advice about their relationships or about their money issues. <laughs> that suddenly that, those people who were his wardens who kept him in prison, his guards, became his friends, became people who were helping him. Break. He was still on death row. It was still awful. We don't ever want to pretend that suddenly he's like in this blissful uh, retreat center. But in that small place of prison, he was finding greater and greater light because he was finding greater and light in the meantime. Yes, he was working towards his greater freedom, but he was finding his freedom in the moment, connecting, participation, and forgiveness, and miracles happen right now. Let's pray. And so we open to that infinite goodness of God that is not time or space bound. It is not condition bound. It is not circumstance, circumstance, circumstantially bound. It's not people bound. It is unlimited and free. Right now. Not tomorrow, not in 10 years, but right now in this moment in the depths of our heart is this divine presence. We are already connected. We are already unified with the divine presence of pure spirit. We are already that pure innocence. We are already that always already enlightened self. We are already fully awake and alive in pure spirit. Nothing needs to change or be fixed or, or manipulated out side of us. It all already exists within us. So we joyfully and blissfully take this moment to just breathe into our heart space and feel into this always already fullness, this always already aliveness, this always already innocence, this always already freedom. Everything that we ever have needed has already been given to us. All the love, the joy, the peace, the harmony, the grace, it has all already been given. It's here now. That perfect relationship we're looking for, that intimate love is right here within us now. That perfect job where we get to creatively express ourselves, it's within us now. That financial abundance, the abundant life, it's in us now. Heaven on earth is in us now. And we get to choose in this moment to collectively be in agreement that that power and that presence transcends everything in the physical 
mental life. It transcends anything that we can ever conceive. It is real. It is more real than the chairs upon which we sit. And we choose, we choose to see and know that first and foremost every day throughout the day. And it is in, through, and as this life that is, moves, and has its being, lives, moves, and has its being as each and every one of us, that we know any place where we feel like we've been off, where we haven't been in alignment with who we really are, we allow ourselves to be forgiven, to let ourselves go free from our own judgments, from all our conditions and our circumstances of who we should be to deserve love, how we should be acting to deserve love. All these things that we feel that we've done that, li- that block us from the love because we may not deserve it or we're guilty of this or that. We allow ourselves to be completely, fully, 100,000% forgiven. The divine presence holds nothing, nothing against each and every one of us. It holds nothing against anybody else. That it is very nature to love, it can do nothing but love, and it never has a reason not to love. Always, it begins and ends and is fulfilled through every moment in time and space as love. So we allow this love, this unconditional love, to wash over us, these, any energy of forgiveness to wash over us even now. And as we feel and open our heart to this forgiveness for ourselves and for anyone else we may hold in judgment, we feel that heaven already exists on earth. It's not going to become on earth. It already exists. And it's happening through us, through our awareness right here and right now. And we hold this place for all those people who we love, all our family members, our friends, our community, our neighbors, all those who we may not know, but we know that they are part of who and what we are, all beings on this planet. We hold the children who are held in immigration camps, separated from their parents. We hold their innocence and their wholeness even now, the light even where they are now, where there's so much anger and hatred and rage and cruelty. We breathe. And we have to know that behind all of it is this wholeness, is this love that knows no separation. We choose life in the meantime. We choose love in the meantime. We choose light in the meantime. We choose wholeness in the meantime. We choose truth in the meantime. We choose freedom in the meantime. We have that power to choose every moment, and today we choose the truth of who and what we really are and who and what this life is. And so I invite us now to take any place within ourselves or in other people and situations that are on your mind, that are in your heart, and just to hold the truth. And if you want to say names out loud, circumstances out loud, to speak that out into this consciousness of truth, of wholeness, of love, I invite you now to do so. place that we feel is imprisoning us we call out the freedom and the lightness within those places that are imprisoning us that are block that we feel are blocking our good or the collective good we see light we see wholeness any place that we may consider other we see light we see wholeness any place where we see the enemy, we see light, we see wholeness, we see freedom. We are the life of pure spirit that is free from all conditioned circumstances. We are free from all limitations of time and space. That is who we really are. We choose this, we see it, we feel it, and from this we know that we are the place that heaven and earth is being birthed moment by moment, breath by breath, through the consciousness that we are individually and collectively. For this, I am so profoundly and deeply in awe and gratitude 
We feel it. We know it. We accept it, and we thank God for it. Thank you, thank you, thank you, God. And we release this word into the law of life, knowing that as we have known it here this morning, it is done. And I invite us all to say together now, and so it is. Amen.